Hello, I'm Dan McDowell, longtime professional broadcaster. Why subscribe to our Patreon podcast? Well, perhaps you support our struggle to get out from under the oppressive thumb of the man. Or objectively, if you sign up at patreon.com slash the dumb zone, you'll get the two episodes per week that are available on all podcast platforms like this one, plus an additional two episodes each week that are exclusive to Patreon. So subscribing on Patreon gets you four episodes per week. Oh my, what a bargain. Now, on to today's program. The Dumbs Up, Dumbs Up, Dumbs Up. What you are witnessing is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in a California municipal court. Both parties have agreed to dismiss their court cases and have their disputes settled here in our forum, The People's Court. That's what preceded Judge Judy and Judge Joe Brown and Judge Softy. The People's Court? Yeah, that was that was the original, the oh, OG. Yeah. My grandpa watched that every day. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I'm very familiar. Is that Judge Wapner? Yeah. You ready that, for Wapner? That's the little rain man. Yeah, I guess I don't remember that. But I, I remember the intro, and I remember as they were walking up, it's the... Yeah. We were in court, Blake. Yeah. Yeah? The weirdest part about it was that... Like, Dan would go in and put down a boom box and then just, like, press play on that, come back out and walk in so that it would be doing the ba bum bum <laughs> <laughs> whenever we walked in every day. And I'm like, all right, man, I guess. I love a theme. A yep. intro music. So the first two episodes were you guys leaving the ticket, uh, you get Jake got served at his house, you're preparing for what could be a trial, then the last episode was how it helped your lawyers actually knew who you were um, because that was a theme in the last episode of how, you know, a lot of the other side's lawyers were asking you like what a benchmark was. <laughs> and it really helped that uh, your people knew who you were. Yeah. Uh, and they listened to the station. They yeah, knew the bits. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, went through Woodshed Weekend. And then here we are. This episode is strictly about the hearing, mm. which is the meat, right? It's where the transcripts came from and, uh, this is prob- probably the episode everyone has been dying to hear is just about the hearing. And um, what a sell. Yeah, I almost want to listen. Uh, but you should. I'm in I mean, France. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're recording this, um, so, you know, ahead of time as we record. So we recording this later. We did the lawyer roundtable six hour slog. <laughs> it was a long day, man. Talk about woodshed. Like, it kind of feels like just sitting around talking for six hours should be easy. In fact, ask my wife if I have yeah. a hard job. <laughs> she she, she will be like, what? You just sit there and talk. You would have to ask mine if she even considers this a job. Yeah. <laughs> but I was so beat that day. But yeah, then, uh, so we recorded that. Blake has cut it up very nicely. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we're just recording the intros for the week. I guess today... Is Thursday, March something, 11, 12, 13, 14, I think, right? 14th? Yeah. Okay. March 10th. So I'd like to keep the theme here and just play like a brief clip because like, like you said, we were recording for so long and I want to make sure I get y'all's opinions on, on what we're doing. So um, I thought this was very interesting and I'm pretty sure if, if I remember right, this is more so Dan's call of, it would have been very easy just to parade your former coworkers on the stand. However, that would have created a weird situation for them where they're having to explain truths and then have to go back and work <laughs> for the company. Uh, so I thought this clip uh, from the episode is, real, is really interesting. And I'm not criticizing you, Philip. You're an awesome lawyer and you want to win and you want to ensure that we're going to win. And so... I'm going to call all the witnesses I can to win. Like, well, also, you're like, hey, I think I have a 90% chance of winning. If I call these other people, I have a 95% chance, and I'm going to do it. It was less about that than about causing pain. Um, and this is the thing <laughs> that you this is the thing this that point. you were very resistant to the entire time. It, 
Litigation, really any kind of negotiation, is about the use of pressure, positive and negative. And what we knew is that they were hypersensitive to negative press. And so if we'd put Bob on the stand, for instance, we could have gotten some really kick-ass testimony that would have cast them in the shittiest possible light. And that's what I was trying to do. (laughs) And... I have a personal relationship to deal with yeah, there. As do well, I. Did, same with some of the advertisers I didn't want to call in. Like, hey, I, I you know. Yeah. I'm just and, trying not to. And, and we have another example of me listening to you. Yeah. And those. Yes. Right. And those. He's so pliable. Yeah. Those people. <laughs> if we called in people that worked for the ticket, they have to go back and work for the ticket again. And for the yeah. same people who were in the same courtroom with them who also had to testify. And that, that was just something that. And that really was why, like, when everything broke down for me that night that Frank is talking about, that was what I was envisioning. So, a lot like we talked about last episode, there was a difference between Dan and Jake on the stand, and then apparently here, there was a difference of how you wanted to win the case and how Philip did. Philip wanted to just drag them through the mud and just slaughter them while you were saying, hey, we have to consider the people that still work there. I don't think you should say just me, too. Jake was... A pretty major part of this. Whole I would say that was yeah. one area where we were pretty much in total alignment. Yeah, uh, Dan and I, not necessarily uh, all members of council, but they're doing what they know how to do. Yeah, you know? I mean, they, they're doing it the way that they've done it before. That's why they are very good at what they do. It was just that, uh, yeah, on this particular issue and on a number of other ones, Dan and I were just like, I don't know, man. Don't and I'm know. sure they didn't receive that well at first. Well, and the thing is, we didn't want to. They didn't want to lose. Yeah, and I didn't want them to lose. They would have shut us down. You know, this was just a thing to shut down the podcast, and then there would still be a trial to come. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and, and there were definitely but, like discussions about like who all is going to get hit with this, and it was going to be basically anybody who's worked there, anybody who works there now, anybody who's worked there whenever. Everybody would be deposed. You know, you get a subpoena. They could bring it to your house like they did for me with a cease and desist. And, like, that just to me, I don't know. Seemed way too far. I was just like, I don't know. We like, would have we would have if it if got it, to if trial. If it got to the you, point where you had to, to do what you got to yeah. do. But at that time, for yeah. me, I was just like, man, what if we could just not have that happen? <laughs> so there's there's a ton of good nuggets in this one. Obviously, it's all about the hearing. Um, if anyone followed the, the court case and read the transcripts, this gets all into that Uh Collie, uh, Frank Collie going at them and Jake's moment. And there's a ton here. It's, it's, it's a meaty episode. It's a little longer than the rest, but this is, if you're looking for um, the perfect encapsulation of the hearing, this episode is it. Man, the trial or no hearing wasn't a trial, a hearing felt like a trial, mini trial, but it was to me, it was incredible. And I thought everybody was incredible in that. And Frank, like it, it seemed like TV. You know, it's like uh, let's take a look at the, let's re- rewind the the tape and what you said earlier, and uh, let's just one of I mean, the days just lead him down a path. Or one of the days when you weren't there, uh, it might have been when we were in Liz's office. I don't remember, but I don't know. I was so anxious and so nervous, and just trying to like relieve my nerves a little bit. And I made all of them listen to my impression of each of them. Do you guys remember this? I thought Very that was good. Mediation. It might have been mediation. It was mediation. When you weren't there. I mean, yeah. Frank's the down home oh, country lawyer. Let's, the, let's hear it, man. Uh, you know what I'd rather hear? I'd rather hear Frank go at Blake. <laughs> I don't know if he could just flip it like that. And Mr. Jones. <laughs> it's always the lean forward, the glasses off. Yeah, yeah like take the glasses, yeah. set it down. Yeah. Well, uh, Bob, the mediator, and I were both very convinced that they were not going to go forward with the September 15th hearing. Um, and you know, Bob's Bob's specific word to me was, they shouldn't. Um, so, you know, I was surprised that they felt like they had to have a, a courtroom outcome. And I can only assume that that's because of some dynamic between the client and the lawyer. I, sure. I, I don't know what else to ascribe that to. And so it, I was, you know, we felt... I think your team, the four of us, felt extremely confident that you guys were as prepped as 
you possibly needed to be. And part of the reason that the, the prep is difficult and it does wear you the hell out like that. And it's not just you, Dan, it's everybody. Anybody who spends a day trying to get prep for court is going to feel really tired. Um, and it's because what we're doing is trying to put you through something that is worse than what you're going to experience on the stand. Sure. Well, and you like did. Out. You did because I kept thinking, the day we woke up while we're in court, like once before I got called up there, they got some, there's a zinger. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Some smoking gun. I've said a lot of stuff. Yeah. I don't remember anything. I, you know, <laughs> sure. I, I'm sure I said something and they pulled, they're going to play a piece of audio that I, I'm not ready for. They're going to make me look, they're going to pull my pants down up here. Like, what do they have? There is something that that. How he, many conversations did you and I have like that? That our lawyers it would be every didn't night. Think Dan of. and I were like, "What are we not like? What are we not seeing?" Yes, and I think Matt's even told us once. Like he's like, "I woke up at four and I was reading everything again." Like because I, I'm trying to think, what did I miss? Like what did be- I? Because you know? their behavior was so irrational, and this is the the thread through all of this. Is you're like, okay. You're trying to make sense of it, and it, it didn't make sense. And I mean, we saw with the hearing, which I'm sure you're going to get into, like it it was a it was a disaster for them. Maybe something was planted from uh, one of those Reddit or my ticket confession was like uh, they've got a they're going to put a they got a boot or they got a yeah, trump card or yeah. something was, was like, like a I don't want a boot. So no, no I'm, I'm like they, they got us. These, these are really high, bad. High, we have. <laughs> We have a ragtag group of uh, lawyers that don't know each other. They've never worked together. They, I don't know them. Uh, they have like this huge, high-priced firm that, if when I told McCool who their firm, he's like, "Oh, mm-hmm. they've got that's a hot, that's a big time. Oh my gosh, that's a uh, this guy's an NLRB expert, you know? Like, oh my gosh, you know? And mm-hmm. who's Matt Brunig? He's this guy." Who bothers people on Twitter? And it's like, I don't know. Maybe they've got to have some kind of, you yeah. know, it's intimidating when you see a group of guys walk in with their briefcases. And, oh, and, extremely. And it, it's it it's true. And they've got money to, you know, there's no end to their money. They could let this go for two years. That's what Liz would tell it. Like, hey, you know, do you guys have the money to let this go for two years? I don't know. If, you know, no, we don't. Um, and they're, you know. Uh, so anyway, but it never came. It never what there was never the zinger that, um, you know, we can t- start talking the trial uh, now. And I don't know if you want not trial, sorry, the hearing. But to me, like, uh, I mean, I don't know what you guys were surprised with. But when they brought up like, uh, you know, uh, did you ever think of geo fencing your podcast? And I'm like, no, like, I think what they're referring to is kind of a technology what I'm re- what I'm aware of it is with uh, the scooters. When you have a scooter in uh, Los Angeles, yeah, you can drive around. Um, but when you get close to the Staples Center, all of a sudden it just stops working. Yeah, I like mean, there's some technology in the air that makes it okay. Yeah, it yeah. won't. Uh, you know, I don't know what, how it does it, but GPS. They, I guess they can shut down something. Right, you can be in a, yeah, in a and, room where no cell phones will work because they have a. And I think the most the most common iteration of it is online gambling. Right. Like you can't go to Pennsylvania's, you know, you can gamble online in Pennsylvania at like, it's just like the lottery. So so they're, they were saying you should have done something to make your podcast not be available to anyone. Basically, they were saying that uh, you should check the IP of everyone who comes in and the location of that IP and only people who are not in the DFW area. Yeah. I guess like YouTube TV, if you're out of uh, market, you you can't. Okay. Yeah, this and was that, sort of their their third way between saying you can't podcast at all and saying no, we're not saying that he couldn't podcast at all, but he he couldn't podcast in this area. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the, and, and the the that was a surprise that had not been in any of their pleadings, that had not been in their their complaint. Yeah, so that's it, my it, one surprise. It did come as a surprise, and and I sort of <laughs> wish, I sort of wish we would have seen that argument before because it. it Afterwards, I looked into it, and it was a ridiculous argument. The only way you could actually do that is if you control the means of broadcasting. In yeah. other words, you can't do if it. We if, controlled Patreon. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, if you're putting your stuff on Patreon, yeah. you can't geofence. You can only do it on your own yeah. like, hosted website. If you if you if you own the means of broadcasting, whether it's the radio station or, you know, they use geofencing a lot in uh, in in advertising. 
like they'll shoot out ads, but we only want ads around our store to cell phones that are around our store. That kind of thing you can do, but you have to be in control of the means of broadcasting. And when you guys put your stuff on uh, Apple Podcasts or Patreon or YouTube, you don't have any control over who does and doesn't see it. Well, what they were trying to do was, look, we know they didn't <clears throat> have anything. That was the closest thing that they had. And we know that they hadn't thought of it before then because they never mentioned it in mediation. Um, and what they were trying to do is create a situation. And this goes back to what you were talking about, Dan. It's not a contract. It's not just a contract. That's never how these things go. You there's a there's a baseline requirement of reasonableness of whatever relief the judge is going to grant. And so showing unreasonableness in related matters is incredibly important to your case. That's why we were hammering you on that so much. Um, and so the what they were trying to do with that last ditch, desperate, bullshit, geofencing question is to try to get a hook into the judge to say, OK, maybe I'll issue a very limited preliminary injunction that says you got to geofence your podcast. Now, if that had happened, we would have like had the argument about that's not actually possible, Your Honor, and and you know all all that stuff would have would have gone from there. There was no reason to really deal with it, especially after Dan swatted it into the <laughs> second level of the the seats. And uh, it, but that that's you know it it sucks and it's not explainable in rational terms but it's just they showed up with a bag of nothing nothing when i liked your uh one one thing that was new before the second hearing was they designated a potential witness their expert <laughs> i forgot about that guy and we and we were a little worried we were like what is this so frank took his deposition you know was it a couple days before it was friday before monday hearing yeah yeah and yeah they for, for the listeners, they, they designated an expert who was an expert on the listening habits of, of audio listeners, all forms, radio, a podcast, streaming, books on audio. He was, a, he was a surveyor, and he did tons and tons of surveys on what people spent their time listening to. And... Essentially, what they were designated him for was to say that any podcast, it competes with the ticket because your, your regular audio consumer only spends a certain finite amount of time in a day consuming audio content of whatever kind. And therefore, just because podcasts were an audio form... That was eating in. That would be eating into the tickets um, audience again because there's only a finite amount of time sure. that people spend listening to or consuming audio products, and it was super general. It had no application to this case whatsoever. And what I mean by that is, it, he 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 hadn't done any analysis, didn't have any data on Dallas Fort Worth as a market, sports radio as a sub market. And what kind of impact podcasting in general was having on the specific market of DFW sports listening? So he, in, in, in the law, we call that an analytical gap. He has an opinion that's probably a valid opinion, but it doesn't apply to the facts of our case. And his, I, his, his what, what I know Phillips wanted to jump on is he called, he called this whole concept the share of ear. And that really got Phillips goat from the very beginning. I, it's still well, so funny to me. The, it being essentially, you can't listen to two things at once, and I can't remember exactly what the judge said, but at the end of his testimony, she was kind of like, okay, like, why, why did we do this? <laughs> yeah, because... I felt, like, I felt like he was confusing uh, like an economic concept of competition with a legal concept of competition, right? Like they, they, all, they all seem to be mixing that up. It's not enough to say that someone who's listening here might listen less. It has to be that the form of what you're doing is also competitive, you know, not just in a market share sense, but in, in 
similarity of what you're doing exactly. Yeah. And also, it, you guys are the the because customer is is the is the advertiser. That's the actual consumer market. It's not the listener. And you weren't taking advert. I, I thought the whole thing was really. Cool. Oh, that was another I, point. I, I think up. that yeah. was the most central point. Who's the customer? Correct. Yeah. yeah, and that we're taking customers away from the ticket. Well, no. Yeah. We clearly told customers that wanted to pay us we're not in that business. There were a couple of other, uh, you know, there's times where I'm sure, I, I think all all three or maybe all four of you guys said that you, you do this routinely. I know Dan and I do it uh, with the show, but where you just get out and you're like, man, why didn't I say this? Why didn't I think of this? There's been like 20 different things, and I'm like, why didn't I pass Frank this note? Why didn't I tell Liz this? Like, the part where they were uh, complaining about us having confidential info because of the ratings. I mean, they literally have instructed an employee to post the ratings on the internet. <laughs> and I have at times pushed back on that a little bit because I feel like to me, that's like actually my work info that I don't know that we should be putting that out there. You know, sometimes it doesn't look great on us. Usually it does. But I just I, I always thought it was weird that we like have a like a surrogate part time employee who posts our ratings on Reddit, and then they're going to go in front of a judge and say, well, these guys have rating and in, uh, ratings info that is somehow proprietary and exclusionary, and not even think of the fact that I know there's a guy that you've had posted on the internet. Also, anyone could buy these. They're you can't. You can't buy them. I mean, Barry Horn used to do it every month or at least every three months so that's you know that's not confidential i'm sorry if it's that's the third party that sells it to anyone who wants to buy it <laughs> you can buy it for sure but it just it made me insane that it's like you actually have a guy posted every month well it so, used to be the law in texas that um confidential information was one of the only things that could support a non-compete and that that law unfortunately has changed a little bit but they were trying to make the argument that you guys had confidential <laughs> confidential information and I have been having this argument with Cumulus for years now about there is no such thing as confidential information that you would give to a radio host. Like if you had kind of confidential information, that's the last person you'd give it to. <laughs> yes, please don't give it to us. <laughs> we, we are we are we are uh, reckless at and best. And their their response to that, if you guys remember from the negotiation, was that. Uh, if you guys know the details of a remote or a, or a promotion, that's totally confidential because your competitors could make hay out of that, which also isn't quite true. But again, these are things that you're about to advertise. Like, you don't tell the host right, if it's a, confidential. There's a promo <laughs> that will be coming out. It's uh, it's pretty public. Um, here's my court notes, and then everybody, anybody jump out. So this is the hearing, the actual hearing. Which at the end of it, um, I believe the temporary injunction was uh, denied by the judge. I have that written in my notes. Correct. So this is Friday, the 15th of September. Um, at first, everybody's sitting around whispering. There was a squeaky chair, and they had somebody come in to remove it. <laughs> which I, I He's very meticulous. I just thought it was just odd, but that's annoying to the judge, and I guess, you know. Then we start with "Let us pray," mm -hmm. which I certainly grew up understanding that there's a separation of church and state. But then I suppose <laughs> when you if you take a look at your money, swear on a Bible and, uh, and God, yeah, it's uh, it's I just let us pray threw me for a loop. Like, oh, like in okay, I guess we were sitting in there are pews. You know there are, and there's a box of Kleenex in Functionally, every yeah. in every uh, in every aisle. Uh, the judge started out saying she was not happy with the filings yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, that was the stuff about Philip uh, on his podcast and us playing nasty audio or something. I don't know. Um, then it was the plaintiff opening statement. Then to be was, clear, she wasn't happy with their filing. I yes. think she also, she wasn't happy but that But trying to play filed. a little both sides, like, hey, but, you know, regarding their filing, yeah. Philip, why are you spouting off on your podcast? Yeah. That's she, that's kind of what she said. She was upset that you were doing it, but she, yeah, she was upset with their filing, and she didn't like 
that we were going tit for tat, and so I'll take the hit for that because Philip was very against filing anything. He oh, read, we we filed he, a response. He read her right, and he was like, "The judge is going to know this is you know BS, and she's not going to pay attention to it." But because of how like serious the allegations they made in there were, I just felt like you know we can't not say anything. We have to like defend ourselves, you know. And so we did. We filed a short, like one or two page thing. But you were right, Philip. We should not have. And if, for people who have read the transcript, that's what she was referring to when she said that the she felt like the kids were fighting in the sandbox. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this is fast forwarding, but fast forward a couple of weeks later when we're now in another mediation and and actually came to a settlement by the end of that the there's it was a, a big news in the courtroom when they found out somebody had bought the transcript because it's a, apparently a high dollar item yeah that had to have been at least $1000 it was $1700 $1, yeah to buy the transcript we've since communicated with that guy yes and uh but it was not at our behest. I want to be clear I was about surprised that, that oh, someone, didn't. yeah, just for fun, was like, I'm immediately going to request the transcript. Yeah, Man, I, need, I need to read this. It would have been a lot more in state court. I believe he put it out, it was only, the he day, put it out on quick. Twitter and whatnot the, the, that day, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. yeah we, if you'll remember, the judge, when we first started the mediation that day, and for the listeners, what happened was the judge had volunteered to serve as a mediator after our hearing to try to get the case settled. And we took her up on that. The day that it started, she announced to us, somebody has requested the transcript. Do you? Does anybody have any objection to us releasing it? And I think the Just only thing was... Kind of you guys, like, am I supposed to? Yeah, like, well, like, the, only, the only issue was it contained, like, your salary information. And yeah, she we wanted like, to know care. whether we wanted that redacted. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if we fast... If we're talking about that the judge actually helped with the, uh, you know, we're the ones who requested that you know, because when when this all ended, she said, "All right, both parties." You know, she was like, "Look, lawyers, why don't we?" It seems like in this case, we could just have the people get together and decide. Blah blah blah. And I think she correctly read it that, <laughs> it, and not that it was you guys. You guys were our defense team. We weren't on the offense. Um, but it was kind of like a, "Hey, what if?" It seems like. The individuals here, you know, the local people there and, and uh, at, at the business and then us, like, seems like you kind of all want this to go away. So why don't you guys, and yes, I'm the one who called uh, Dan Bennett. I was going to say, I think it speaks to the integrity of, of Bennett that, you know, for whatever, you get crossways and negotiations or whatever, but it wasn't like he was just not going to answer your call. No, he's like, we've already been in court for right no X we had been through hours. the like, hearing it, and we they already had, had done the whole thing that we didn't want to do and he was still like yeah i want to be right let's let's yeah figure this out and uh yeah to to dan bennett's credit for I'm sure i'm not sure everybody would have done that um absolutely you're absolutely right Okay, we unpause here no puppet or maybe this is a whole new <laughs> show we don't know we're uh it's a marathon session with our awesome dream team of attorneys. Um, and uh, Blake, we'll just tell people to go back and listen to episode one for the introductions to all that. <laughs> what a jerk. Uh, me? You were the one that, that was the jerk. Anyway, just put him in the show notes. Put him in the show Say notes. Say your names again. Who are you? No, I, Frank Hawley. Liz Griffin. Philip Kingston. McCool Kelker. Okay. And then Brunig's And gone. you? I think... Uh, our audience knows our voices. Okay, and I then just, you? These three or four I new people Dan that McDowell. they're hearing, okay. they may I just, just want to get reset voices everything. straight. Uh, Jake Kemp, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I'm the At idiot. All. Jacob Matthew. At all. And now, I will say this. I've never hung out with all of you guys. And at the end of it, not been completely exhausted. And I think today <laughs> is yeah. proving. I thought, oh, we'll do this in two hours. We'll uh, we'll go get uh, something to eat. Like this has been a long, long session, and I'm sure uh, in the next, if we can wrap this at half hour, hour, it'll I'll be exhausted by the end of it. Um, so back to uh, we're back to the middle of the hearing, not a trial, the hearing. But I do want to say this: this is another thing, and it's it's a bit self-serving. But obviously, we didn't want the trial or the hearing to ever happen. We tried to push that back. We tried to do everything we could. We didn't want this negativity. Once we did have the hearing scheduled, 
Now, this is the difference in personalities. Philip was ready to call a bunch of witnesses from, uh, you know, former co-workers of ours. We're going to compel that. You know, what do you call it? Subpoena. Yeah, you send a subpoena. They're going to have to be up here. We're going to tell, you know, they'll tell the truth. The people that we had called trying to get this push forward know some of the things that we could publicize that would look very bad if we had to go to a, a, a hearing. And then there's other stuff, you know, and it's all just subjective look bad. Maybe not. Maybe, you know, but in my mind, I don't want to I don't want to be negative towards these guys I've worked with for a long time. Even the ticket in general, you know, uh, I love them. So. Uh, you know, and that's when I think maybe the weekend prior, uh, we stepped forward and said, Hey, wait, wait, like we have, we've already been assured, you know, Frank, Liz, Philip, Matt, they're all like, we've got a great chance. Like this, the fact that they are going through with the hearing, it's a bad job by them. We're going to do fine. We're going to come out of that fine. Like, I guess what I mean by that is they will not put a, temp- a restraining order on you. You're going to be able to podcast. Now, there might be a trial, though, at the end. Um, and that's where we kind of said, hey, let's hold off the big guns. It, like, you obviously could just destroy them right here, but you also thought, well, I'll also win if I just use one gun. And that's like, say, uh, you know, Adam Romo was the guy who was going to testify. I had other advertisers who I could have gotten to the court, but I knew I better save that for a trial. So that's all I just wanted to state. If anybody disagrees, agrees, remembers that. Uh, oh, no. I, I yeah. remember that. And I think I may be remembering wrong, but I think at that point we were not at all thinking the case would settle anymore because we did not, we didn't know the judge was going to say at the end of the hearing, I can get involved, you know, in in a you know settlement conference or something and so we went into the hearing being like okay well we're doing this hearing then we're doing discovery then we're going to trial. and i'm not criticizing you philip you're an awesome lawyer and you want to win and you want to ensure that we're going to win and so i'm going to call all the witnesses i can to win like, well also- you're like hey i think i have a 90 percent chance of winning if i call these other people i have a 95 percent chance and i'm going to do it it was less about that than about causing pain um and this is the thing Everyone that you. This is the thing this that point. you were very resistant to the entire time. That litigation, really any kind of negotiation, is about the use of pressure, positive and negative. And what we knew is that they were hypersensitive to negative press. And so, if we'd put Bob on the stand, for instance, we could have gotten some really kick-ass testimony that would have cast them in the shittiest possible light. And that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> and I have a personal relationship to deal with. Yeah, there as do well, I. Did, same did, with some of the advertisers. I didn't want to call in. Like, hey, I, I, you know, yeah, I'm just and, trying not to. And and we have another example of me listening because yeah, and those yes. right, and those he's so pliable. Yeah, those people. <laughs> if we called in people that worked for the ticket, they have to go back and work for the ticket again. And for the yeah. same people who were in the same courtroom with them, who also had to testify, and that that was just something that. And that really was why, like, when everything broke down for me that night that Frank is talking about, that was what I was envisioning. Because as Liz said, like, at that point, I thought, all right, well, we're definitely doing this. It is kind of interesting that, to me, the radio station works really well because, in large part, it doesn't have a ton of oversight from the way that the rest of corporate radio works. You know, I know that there are other radio stations that try to do this whole, like, we're we're rebels against you know the man the ticket just is but there were some things it was kind of like all right well it it was they, clear do the people who are representing them really want to know like right it was clear in our even negotiations that some things that the uh, parent company doesn't know you know they don't have yeah. huge communication they're not yeah, really aware like what other fact, people are doing like, on the side or whatever it was kind of like us you know one of the the whole podcast thing was a hypothetical like we'd like to be able to do something mm-hmm. okay so you're gonna do you're gonna do a sports podcast then uh no and then that's where dan bennett would jump in and say yeah but actually the ticket isn't totally sport like he had to explain to the yeah, higher ups several like, times he had to, that was in contract negotiations that yeah. led here um so it's 
It's like, no, 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 that's, you know, I think. But it's kind of the gift and the curse, right? Yes. Well, yeah. It was so weird that there was so little communication from, you know, ticket level people up to the supposed brains behind the corporation. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've never worked anywhere else, so I don't know how, like, most of these organizations' flowcharts work. But in any case, I feel like uh, we were to the point where we're saying we were trying to be somewhat cool. Yeah, it it, it was a theme, the whole thing, all the way through. Dan was like, it's the be cool strategy. And they just, and we talked about this, you know, the reason they thought y'all were doing nefarious things is because they do nefarious things. Like they're assuming your behavior is like their behavior. And so, you know, I I don't, it it was, it never got through to them that we were trying to be cool. I think it got through to some people, but maybe not to people at upper levels. So we're in a hearing. Um, you nailed it that time. We prayed. You have the plaintiff op- opposing statement or opening statement. Then you have our opening statement. So remember, they're the plaintiff. They are, you know, they're trying to stop us. We're just we're Little Red Riding Hood. We're doing nothing. Um, <laughs> also known as defendants. We're the defendants. Uh, then it's so apparently the way this works, it's the plaintiff goes first calling witnesses. And. That was a question, right? Did we know whether they were going to call their people or our people first? Is that a choice? It's their yeah. choice. Okay, but okay, so we they, talked a lot about it because thought maybe you know conjecture. Well, they'll call Jake first or me for I don't remember what we thought, but what they did was they called. It looks like uh, I don't remember if it was Dan Bennett or Jeff Catlin. First. Catlin, cat was Catlin, first. Cat was first. Okay, so then. I'll just tell you my perspective of this, never having been in a trial. So somebody, maybe Liz, had given us a a post-it notes. And so the bit is, you've got post-it notes and a pen, and I have them all here. I have my stack here. Of all the post-it notes, we would, if we heard him say something or something was, you know, uh, I, I think Frank could use this information or lit, you know, I would write, jot something down. And I'd uh, hand it over to Liz, and then she'd hand maybe decide, okay, this is worthy of Frank, or maybe it's not worthy of Frank, or I'd hand something just for Jake, um, or you know, it's a picture of a wiener. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we went through a lot of post-its. Yeah, it's it's in. Maybe we'll post these someday. I don't know. We'll put it on I our, think that's probably not legal, but I don't know. Wall. Well, it's no. my notes from. <clears throat> I mean, it's, during it was okay. You could have been a. Uh, I mean, who would I ask? Yeah. <laughs> you don't know any lawyers. <laughs> I don't know any lawyers. Um, yeah. Had to do with show budget, paying for our websites. I'm just looking at different things. Uh, ratings. Uh, n- they were saying us leaving was hurting the ratings. Uh, and we we're like, well, Norm left the week before. Are you saying Norm leaving didn't hurt? Yeah, that could have hurt the ratings. Uh, and obviously the ratings have been fine. Quite fine. Since we've left. So, um, like, none none of their original arguments held up and would have looked even worse had a trial gotten there in Jan- in December, I would think. Because, okay, now you've come off three number one books, and uh, these guys were doing irreparable ha- you know, whatever. So, Well, um, it, you know, I think the, the key part of that testimony, um, I mean, Catlin's cross-examination under Frank was very useful for us because I think he came off as not being very forthcoming with the court. Yeah. And you um, did a really good job of reading him and, yeah. you know, adjusting. But I think, I think, you know, we finally, it took a bit of doing, we finally got Bennett to admit that at a, a, a sort of a normal number of listeners for midday or wherever is like maybe a hundred thousand people. That at any given point in the day, that's a pretty good estimate of who, how many are listening. And so at that point, y'all had... Thir- and that might even be adding up a few like, hours. I don't know. Yeah. Because I always thought at one particular time, it might be like 25,000. But still. But I'm talking out of my rear end. But he, not, at that point, we knew exactly how many listeners y'all had, and it was like 3,600. Yeah. And so we were like, well, Mr. Bennett, where did the other 95,000 go? Yeah. 
You know, because that's what they were trying to do is say... And certainly our 3,600 at the time were not... All listening. All men <laughs> between the age of 25, 54 who lived in DFW. We could prove that if it ever got to a trial. We would have been, hey, okay, here's the guy in France that listens. Here's a lady, you know, a woman in DFW. Doesn't They don't care. that That's not in their ratings at all. They don't care. We like the ladies. Boy, do we. But you don't remember our names. Liz, <laughs> hell yeah! Was that in court? Yeah, <laughs> twice in court. What and did then I do? You did it. No, What's on the podcast. Philip did it twice in court, and then you did it. And the, I have been waiting for this because, for my own ego, I would like to clarify this. The whole time I was like, on paper, it looks like I am just sitting here in a skirt for window dressing because I had no speaking role, and we had discussions about this and philip wanted me to have a speaking role you are aaron andrews our, our eye candy on the sideline yeah and that, you're not making it better that is well that's what it looks like and i know and i know you guys know and hopefully from my participation in this conversation it's clear that i had a substantive role but um but you know philip you wanted me to uh maybe question adam romo or give you know one of the arguments and i pushed back on it because that's not my like i'm an appellate attorney you guys are the trial attorneys, so I knew it's not going to be best for you guys. I wanted you to argue the judgment as a matter of law. Oh, yeah. Which we wound up not, not even yeah. getting yes. to make that motion. Yeah, I was going to argue if we had a chance to argue the NLRB preemption piece, but we decided not to because it was clearly not the time. Um, and well, you I, certainly saw the way Jake and I reacted to your suggestions. We took them more often than no, not. No, I know. I mean, I'm, I'm just You saying. were the voice of reason amongst a lot of uh, this kind of oh, stuff. Oh, no. I know my value. Okay, so yeah. I just no, want to we, make clear for the record. But me forgetting someone's name is, you should, that's the that badge of honor well, for you. Well, it, <laughs> it was the coincidence that the only people who have forgotten names, it's always my name, and twice for Philip, it was in front of the judge, who was a female judge, so I know he didn't do it on purpose. Right. And, no, she hates me. And we just yeah. spent... <laughs> two days together the full day so it's not like you know we don't know each other but it was it was such a brain fart i, I was really like struggling I know. well because you turned around and i i didn't know what you were doing i was like it took me a I, while I did, to be i didn't like, know what i was uh, doing griffin <laughs> um yeah but i did not want to take adam romo i did not want to make an argument because i knew that is not what i'm good at that would not serve you guys best so it's fine however it looks my best spot is sitting here Paying attention, which I can't do if I'm trying to prepare to question someone, and then, you know, passing notes from the appellate perspective. So, so what happened was, so their first, they get to say stuff to Jeff Catlin, to Cat, our immediate supervisor at the ticket. Um, they go back and forth, and then we get to cross-examine him, right? That's always how it works, I guess? That's it. Okay. So right away, or did they do their thing with Cat? Then they did something with Bennett. No, no, then no. they did us, and then we go back and call Cat back, or you get to respond no. right away. Yeah, okay. they do. They do what's called direct examination first. All right, that's basically put their witness on to tell their story, and then we do immediately after they're done with their direct examination, we start cross examination. That's how it went for each witness: direct, cross, the direct, cross. And I feel like this is where um, I would say. I think they're lawyers. You guys have already made points of saying, boy, I, I'm not sure the lawyers did a, a great job in this particular case. This is one where, so now their big thing with uh, Jeff Catlin was, um, these guys are causing terrible harm. They need to stop their podcast because of all the harm. Uh, well, where's the evidence of that? You gotta, you can't just say that. Okay, well, look at all these uh, emails that they got. And they would say, um, hey, I hate cumulus. I'm going to follow Dan and uh, uh, Dan and Jake. Uh, I'm I'm not. You know, I can't believe they didn't. Uh, you guys couldn't get a deal done. Uh, Dan and Jake forever. Like a lot of good things about us. That's why I like to look online around mm -hmm. that point. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, like vitriol towards uh, the company. And uh, so then they were saying, okay, let's put up the and it's like a movie. And it, there's a big screen. It's a lot um, more like a movie than people. People are always like, it's not like a movie. It is. Yeah, at least this part. Yeah. So there's a big uh, projector screen or uh, I guess computer nowadays, but whatever. It's up on. We can see it up there <laughs> and it would be like, all right, let's take a look at this email. And this was from from Steve. And then it'd be really funny because there'd be like some funny bits in there, too. 
there but was the highlighted parts weren't the funny bits. No, well, there were some the things that profanity. I fe- I feel like they probably could have cropped out <laughs> <laughs> um, that they but, didn't. <clears throat> but in it hindsight, would, again, a litany of those emails, and then at the end, it's like, you see, Your Honor. These terrible guys, and one, I think some of it was like some audio they played of us, of, uh, you know, that, that Akash was... Singh in studio and all that. That yeah. might have been when you were up there. The point is, okay, so this is their big evidence. Uh, Reddit, and message boards, uh, and, Email. you know, emails that they got that, that were very angry. And uh, so this is why these guys are just, look at how they are imploring their listeners, the people to stop listening to the ticket. And uh, so this this is why you got these. And then you noticed something while they were doing this. And now, now we're passing notes back and forth and whispering. And so you felt pretty good about when you did step up to the uh, to do some cross-examination. And now this is where I think it was you were – it was like Matlock. It was uh, – <laughs> Sick reference. That is super current, topical, yeah. and sick. Well, yeah. he just seems like the the country lawyer. The oh, he's he's just you're you fit like a an old glove. You're just uh, you're a very comfortable guy. You know, Philip looks like he's he's uh you know you though you're like I, I'm a friend. <laughs> no, I'm just saying Philip. You know, looks more. You know, he bailed out on both descriptions. Philip's yeah. like a litigator. He's like I'm lawyer. You know, and you're like look, I'm just a guy. We're all. Uh, uh, let me. Let's. We're just talking here. You just have this friendly feel about you that you know. Till it's time not to. Very comfortable, <laughs> uh, Mister Catlin. Did you say that? Uh, and then you pull up one of the emails. Uh, can you read that passage again? Yeah, D- Dan and Jake and and uh, the cumulus bad. Okay, l- let me. You also pointed to this email, did you not? Yes, yes. And and you're and then you pointed this email. You and then you you summarized it with. So you're asserting that these – and this transcript is available. Uh, you're asserting that that uh, these people left because Dan and Jake started a podcast. That's right. Okay. Dan and Jake started their podcast on July 27th. Can we go back to uh, email one? Can you please read the date <laughs> that you received that email? And it would be like – July 18th. And now we know where you're going, and everybody knows, but we still are we doing the... every single email. We're still in the performance. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's it, like we could have ended it right there. All right. Can you bring up email two again, please? John, bailiff, whoever brings up. Uh, can you read the... And then you made him say the date of each of these emails. And it, it, to me, that was a... To me, I would say not a blunder on Cat's part, but a blunder on the lawyers. How would lawyers who are paid, you know, he's not paid big money to figure out what's going to fly in court. But some people are, and and they would see that, know all the dates involved, and still say, yeah, let's go ahead with this. This is a good, this is our strategy. Yeah, I was, uh, when when I heard his direct testimony, I was dumbfounded. Um, because they specifically blamed the two of you for the narrative that the ticket is cheap. <laughs> I forgot about this part. Yeah. yeah, open the door. And and so, you know, I, I started with the the drop. Remember, we had to explain the a drop. Accumulus station. Accumulus station. Yeah. And I got him to admit that's been a drop for decades – that's played when there's a reference to the ticket being cheap. But then I I had to go through the emails. So, you know, and you're right, Dan. What I was doing was I was setting him up. So you remember your testimony that the emails you got led you to believe that Dan and Jake were the reason that listeners think you're cheap. They're responsible for the cheap narrative. Yes, yes, yes. And then I hit him with the dates. Because they did, it was the clip of Akash saying you, yeah. they lowballed you or whatever on your contract. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so then when I hit him with the dates and all those emails pre, predated the very first episode of The Dumb Zone, I got him to admit, which he had to, that none of the emails were proof 
or th- that the emails could not be proof that Dan and Jake was the genesis of the cheap narrative. The only thing I'll say about the emails. Yeah, some of the emails said, yeah, you guys are too cheap to yeah. pay these guys. Uh, like when we got that binder of evidence, you know, we all got one and took it home. It was weeks before, because I think we got it at the first hearing Correct. setting, yeah. so we knew two weeks in advance what they had planned for their exhibits to be, and they knew from us, too. And it was weird to me, too, like, uh, I don't know, Dan and I talk about this sometimes, and, and if you're, it's, we kind of touched on it with you guys in, like, the, the message boards or Reddit or whatever, it just felt to me like they're not, a lot of times management is not really in the position of getting the uh, the volume of feedback that we get. Like, I get tons of people, and, you know, it's not as bad now, but used to. I mean, I would have somebody tell me to kill myself every day. It was just, like, part of the deal, you know? Sorry about that. I mean, (laughs) at some point, you're just like, well, the fifth time, it doesn't even hurt. Yeah, it's just noise. Yeah, whatever. Like, I get to do this cool job because I'm a public figure. I mean, I I would imagine every single person who's a public figure, that's part of it. Right, but they get a lot of positivity because they're in charge of the ticket, the guys that they love. And then, like, for this first time, you know, here's... 20 exhibits of hey we got a, a mean email and i was like i think i said to you guys multiple times i was like this is just tuesday to me like how did you actually submit like mean tweets and mean emails is like <laughs> we're being we're being uh irreparably harmed here i'm like this is just my life it's all of our lives like if you're doing this job i thought that was really i don't know if i want to say soft but i would say tone deaf was, at a minimum was it at this hearing or before that the the judge, I think she said on the record that the court had received an email from the She public. sent it to us. She oh, forwarded okay. the email to us from a listener who emailed the court's chambers. Yeah, that was... <laughs> didn't know how to handle that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> emailed the court's chambers basically saying that uh, they should rule for Dan and Jay. <laughs> but before we get off the... the I promise e- that's not my IP address. <laughs> Before we get off the, the, the issue of the emails, because that was my favorite part of the cross-examination, I want to give some shout-outs to Jacob in Denver. Yes. Who is sub E428. Uh, Michael Marks. Travis Williams, sub E 1571. Brian Thompson, sub E232. Michael Bublik and Eric Frazier, who were the emailers. He reached out to all of them and found their sub numbers. <laughs> And I, I want to give a special shout out to Michael Bublik because his email made Cat testify in trial. That makes me feel bad. What <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> I forgot that. So I just want to give a shout out to those guys because they played a, a role in the trial as well. This is a also, you, have a, here. <clears throat> you had like a Colorado lawyer who also helped you out a little bit. I can't remember how. But uh, he ran down some uh, case law for us. Yeah, he just had he had limited time to help us, and we did actually have like a discreet task he could do. So that was great. Um, okay, so anything else you want to bring up from that particular cross examination, or we move on to? I mean, did we hit the highlights for me? Did you get all your highlights in there? Well, I felt the, like there was a lot floating around yeah, Twitter that were your. Yeah, your, there there was more. Um, you know the the one thing that, that when you when were you great Frank the, yeah. and I, <laughs> that's kind of why I'm trying to be a little bit humble. What do you but like there to was, reflect on? There was one there the the one the one thing that stood out to me the most is when the judge has to interrupt a witness and ask him, "Did you mean to say that?" It's not going good for you. When did that happen? I mm-hmm. forgot that. Yeah, yeah, because my my question was, you know, something to the effect of. You know, you got you got all these emails. These people are mad. And they're mad at you for filing a lawsuit. And they're mad at you for the things that Cumulus did, not the things that Dan and Jake did. So none of these emails, none of the angst that is reflected in any of these emails is Dan and Jake's fault. Isn't that true? And he said, yes. And she said, wait a minute, what, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they like didn't I, get woodshedded like us. <clears throat> like I keep saying, I I do think, you know, I think we had constant com- communication with our lawyers and stuff, and I think their lawyers like flew in and flew out, and and I, I feel like we were extra extra prepped, 
And I just feel like those guys weren't. I don't think they spent near the time that we did preparing for every possible scenario question that could come at them. Well, and, and I'll tell you that, that my opinion. I meant to say this earlier, but that's one of the highest compliments you can give folks like me and Phil um, is that and you're – you're, no, no, because the they prepared you as a witness. Yeah, but you yeah. were sitting there with the notes, notepad. Well, like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. You're, no, you're right, all of us. But that's one of the highest compliments that you can give, that your woodshedding was worse than the actual cross-examination Ugh, at the hearing. Way worse. <laughs> that's what we want. And that means that tells us we did our job. Yeah, because you're trying to come up with everything they might even Absolutely. say. Even a, you know. You know, tell us all the skeletons. See what what are they going to come at you with? Yeah, you guys did make it easy though, in that you know a lot of times you you have a, a case and you have a client you love, but you don't necessarily have the best facts, and so you know it's not as easy to work with. But you guys, it just everything we kept finding just made things better and better for you guys. So other than presentation, you really you didn't have anything to to worry about content wise. I thought whenever we were getting ready, uh, one thing I noticed myself do, and I don't have all my post-it notes, but uh, I think I might have gone first. You um, did? No, no, no. I mean, like, in that, the weekend prior, like, in preparation. And, like, she gave me the review or whatever, and it, immediately it was like, uh, like if you if you see somebody, like, make a pizza once, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, now I'm ba-. – when you started, I was like, <laughs> You knew? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like – I'd done it twice, and at that point, I was already like, I'm a chef now. Like, <laughs> You're grading me? <laughs> yeah, there was a couple. Uh-uh. Shouldn't have said that. Well, that's why we do it. Did so not like that. Try to get it right. But um, I think ultimately, you were the, obviously, the star. So they called Kat, then they called Bennett, and uh, then, I guess, um, Philip cross-examined Bennett. Dan what? Bennett, right? What do you like to reflect on, Philip? Um, the, yeah, you're always shy to brag. Yeah. Um, the uh, I think we got key stuff out of Bennett, um, partly because he, he probably doesn't need as much prep as a witness, but I think he also wasn't prepped. But I'll bet he's done stuff like that. Yeah. Many times. He's and, uh, court. Yeah. The thing that was interesting to me, and I, I pretty quickly figured out why it happened. I had a lot more to talk to them about because I was going to walk him through the entire complaint that he swore to um, and get him to say, you know, now that you've heard this evidence, you know that's not true. Why did you never change this affidavit? Why did you not alert the court that you had put false sworn testimony into the record? Why, you know, all all these things that you do to destroy a witness who's gotten caught doing stuff like that and she didn't want to hear any of it the judge kind of said yeah we get she, it she did yeah. not no she i mean she it was worse than we get it it's did she what tell are, you to move on what are you doing i don't care about that you know and at first i was a little bit irritated and then i pretty quickly figured out all of the testimony was more than she wanted to hear mm-hmm. um, sometimes i am i allowed to say this sometimes i felt like she was kind of doing something else the judges do that? Yeah, a lot, a lot okay. of the time. Because yeah. they have their I know they have so up. much going on, but yeah. I was just like, sometimes I'd be over there and I'd look over at her and I'm like, I feel like you're reading. She did have like an Oculus on. <laughs> yeah, no, I like, thought that was weird too. Yeah, <laughs> she was the <laughs> Apple Vision. That is a joke. <laughs> that is Legal a comedic people. vein. Right. I, well, because you know, like the, the criminal thing that yeah. y'all had to watch. like In the interview the, time. The yeah. things leading up to that, I'm sure were coming through her screen, you know. During yeah. the hearing. Well, and I think I'm very proud of the job we did just from, you know, a law, you know, trial skill perspective. I think we did a great job. But I really think that she was, she knew before we got there that morning exactly what the outcome was going to be. Um, now, you know, we we lawyers love to think that we're the outcome, you know, and, and maybe, maybe we did. Like, I think Frank's closing was remarkably detailed and reframed some issues in some ways that the judge had not heard before, which is a really great strategy. It's a great thing to do if you can in a closing. So like, I feel, I feel very proud of, of the job we did that day. I just think that us knocking down Cumulus's witnesses more, what wasn't going to help and she didn't want to hear it. So that I thought that was just very strange because normally when you've got a witness who has let the court 
stew on stuff that is demonstrably false, that goes super bad for that witness and whatever party brought them. And she didn't care, and it didn't matter. Hmm. That's interesting. I agree with you 100%. I think, I think she had her mind made up going into that hearing, and the hearing... All the stuff we talk about, all the great cross examination, good openings, we were awesome, good closings. <laughs> we were. Te- I agree with you. We were. We did a very good job. I agree with you. None of it mattered. I think she knew going in uh, how she was going to rule, and she ruled directly from the bench. And the part of her ruling, which was very interesting, which we had talked about early in trying to put the defense together, and we never really developed it. Um, it, because it's it was it the first argument to come to mind. She was extremely concerned about the First Amendment. She was not going to tell somebody they can't podcast. Especially on the disparagement issue. She, she really honed in on, you know, you got to prove to me that they intended to hurt you in what they said. And she just didn't see. Well, and, you know, the thing that's refreshing from our perspective as lawyers about uh, Judge Scholler is that with the the way the news today is, whether it's true or just a perception, um, and it is true with certain judges, they've become politicians. They there are lots of judges on the appellate bench, especially, who are not ruling based on real legal thinking or facts or anything, and it's it's highly highly partisan, and it's really. It's really disturbing to people who practice law like like we do because it makes it impossible to predict what the hell they're going to do, uh, including follow the law. And she's like, that's not her. She's very old school. She's like, she's concerned about the First Amendment because she's concerned about the Constitution and whether we raise it or not. She's like, I'm not I'm not messing with these guys First Amendment rights. That's that's how it's supposed to be. And it, it was nice to see that in a judge. Yeah, I thought the whole way through and what you said about she didn't want to hear it on the witness you know the witness issue and i think that's because since it didn't impact the legal the legal issues she didn't care about it because it's not about ego you know i think how you said a lot of judges will they want to hear that um but i liked that about her that it was just it was straightforward so then like i said the dan bennett testimony and then cross-examination now it is our turn for us to call who we want to call or no 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 they they they're still calling people right they called jake they called jake first right of amongst uh dan and jake and i got to tell you although i did feel good about things i was confident um i was happy you went first (laughs) um i'm sure you weren't Nah, but, but we, we we for whatever reason it. We what kept... was your mindset knowing you know you're a guy who I don't know if you puked that day or you did you puked... yeah did you puke before I know no but this was all affecting you. You know, it was a heavy a heavy scene. So how did you feel actually once you actually went up there and got up there? You know and... what was what was kind of cool about it. Um, I mean, I definitely felt you know physiologically affected afterward, but. A cup. Uh, so, like the mornings that we had to go down there, like Dan came to my uh, to my house in the morning, and he was like, uh, you know, he's there. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is so stupid. But it was just like you know, it was like six thirty in the morning. My kids were up, and like Dan was there, uh, like with me in the morning. And it, I don't know, it gave me some level of like confidence. Like coming, I was playing with, playing. Yeah, with you're like kids. playing with my my kid before school or whatever. It's uh, we we rode together, and then uh, yeah, for whatever reason, like I don't know how we arrived on this, but we we felt like it was pretty likely they were gonna do me first. And I don't know what the reasoning for that was. Probably they're just like, well, this is the one who's soft, as evidenced by the last thirty seconds. I wasn't really that nervous going up there, but definitely by the end of it, I was like, damn. That was intense. It felt like it took like six hours, even though it was probably only like 30 minutes. It felt like I was answering a lot of the same questions like over and over and over. Um, And then at some point, I feel like what they're trying to do is reframe something a fifth different way and this time get you to answer it differently and incorrectly. 
So you just kind of like got to try to be on your toes a little bit. Um, I didn't feel a strategy you were prepped for. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) No, I knew that I wasn't going to handle it as well as you did. Um, because again, I was trying to be way more like robotic and just buy the book and like, I just want to get out of here. Um, be honest, be truthful, but say what I know, say what I don't know and get out of here. Whereas I knew the only reason I was like bummed to have to go to the bathroom to throw up afterward was because I was like, damn, I got to get back in there before Dan's up there. Cause this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I want to say this. I, did, you're, I knew that was going to be like a very different approach from the way that I did it. Now, I do think you're soft, but you're referring to yourself as soft and that's self-deprecating. I think you're an emotional person. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's one of my detriments is that I'm not. Well, it's not a detriment. It's well, just it's everybody's yeah. different. And yeah, so I don't think that makes you softer, worse in any way uh, either. <clears throat> but you also got emotional on the stand. And if I'm doing my post game analysis of it, which I am, I would say that kind of didn't hurt our case because you weren't actually not robotic. You were trying to be. I was trying very hard to be. But as I think I am you now, may have but... cried on the stand. Uh, you, at least uh, I choked up. Yeah, you and... <laughs> had some points. It was I don't know if it was just the part about your kid or about you well, know when they were when you were talking about your your colleagues at the ticket. They were alleging yeah that you're you're doing things actively to hurt those guys that you've sat in the you know control room with for 10 years whatever you yeah. know like the that really bothered you like i think it it still bothers me i think <laughs> it makes me look like a bad person a lot of times how i'm unbothered by certain criticisms or the way you know but you like take that to heart and like i don't want mino or whoever thinking that i would be negative towards like or i'm yeah, criticize. I think that's what it was about. They were kind yeah. of kind of alleging that we were criticizing the moves that they made. Yeah. When we said uh, we thought we're so happy for everybody that got elevated, the only one thing is we thought Monty. I, I think Monty is great and was. I I would have had him as a host. I that's doesn't I mean somebody else today. can't be even. You know. Right. Or make yeah. Add another host. Fine. Do that. We were yeah. uh, we were making enough that I'm sure they could uh, do that. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know this, Jake, but um, but I think that helped with the uh, even the judge her opinion of you. Like this guy is not actively trying to f this station. This guy loves this station. Yeah. Whereas. She might have thought I was doing bits half and forth, you know, back and forth. Because <laughs> why, why you that were. Be? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so you, you you may not know this, Jake, but um, Frank had that all mapped. <laughs> like, Frank knew what he was doing getting you to... He knew you were going to get choked up. And he warned me about it, but not you, so that you would get choked up. Yeah, and that, that was one thing that... Um, even today, I, I sort of second guess myself sometimes because I didn't go over with you or I didn't prepare you for the fact that I was going to ask you a question about your son. Um, it's going to get me. <laughs> um, I, that, and the reason I did it was because, if you'll remember at the end of your direct examination, they were insinuating that, number one, you could just move somewhere. You could just pick up your family and move. Right. And, or, and, you could, and, and you're, not, you're not hurting because you right. write for D Magazine. Yeah. Your, your wife has a job. <laughs> yeah, your wife has a job. And, You'll be fine no matter what yeah, happens. Yeah, and, and you write for D Magazine and make $200 a week on writing an article about a Cowboys game. And that angered me. And that's why I brought up your son. That's to to send the message that you had a you're a person with a family with with issues, and that's why I brought it up. Um, to this day, I still question whether I should have. I think it was good. Well, I think you can pretty like clearly say that for the trial type thing. <laughs> you know, it wasn't that's a big gun. It wasn't like uh, that's the only time I've cried in the last X amount of time. So <laughs> you don't have to feel bad about it. And and also, it's I thought not the only time you've puked. <laughs> I don't. He's a crier and a puker. Folks. Yeah, that's right. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure that my body's really working all that point. well. No, and I could tell actually. You know, because the thing about that was like, man, I hope this judge doesn't know me. Like, I know all you guys knew, like, boy, he's not, like, faking this. But, you know, 
I, I was kind of worried that, you know, the judge was going to be like, what is this? This is performative? Yeah. And uh, so that was a little bit concerning to me, but I also, I could tell, you know, one of their attorneys when – when I I did start to like struggle a little bit, you know, he was like, you know, we can stop for a minute if he like, I don't think he thought that it was performative at all. But yeah, I mean, I don't I, think there's any way anyone any viewing that would would question the authenticity. But the the downside of it again was that when I walked in there, I was already like Dan was already like mid show. <laughs> like, Damn, I missed. Oh, it. you had left. You didn't come back till I was already up there. It was like ten minutes. Okay. Yeah, but at that point it was. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I wish. I wish we had pictures because I just wish Blake could see. I don't know. Ooh, just, just Dan just, on the stand Dan at all is stand. funny enough. It was just so funny to me to walk in there because he's Ill, in a suit. It was like ill-fitting suit. Ill-fitting suit. suit. <laughs> yeah, just. When you present, I mean, I know it's the first time you've testified it, and I wonder about this. Of like, <laughs> I'm. I'm much more like Jake in terms of like, you know, anxiety, emotions, but he acts how I would think someone that's an individual that hasn't been involved in a lawsuit before would act. And I've always been floored by how calm you were throughout every, every up and down with everything. And so like, are you, are you feeling the anxiety or do you not feel the anxiety? Like you definitely don't show it, but are you anxious? Uh, yeah. Like in my head, I was waiting for the zinger. I okay. knew they had something. I knew it, and how am I going to react to that? That I just know they've got it because I was not impressed with what we thought they had. And I'm like, that can't be it. That can't be it. And again, Philip, great prep, I guess. I mean, just because you tried to, you were also trying to think, well, what could they have? What could they do? You know, is there something I forgot to tell Philip? Because I don't remember things. And I, I, I mean, they've got a piece of audio, they've got something, they've got, you know, there's going to be a zinger. And I was worried. Yes, I get, you know, I, I, but I like over prepping. I mean, I over prep for our little stupid show. I, I, I print things off. They make fun of me for all the stuff I do, you know, like, um, I got the sense on Sunday, maybe even late on Saturday on the first prep weekend that you had figured out the game and your kind of whole approach to the thing just changed. Cause I was like, God damn it. He's not going to follow any rules. He's. He, I know he thinks he's an expert witness. because he's already figured it. He's figured out this game, and I, I. By the time we got to the actual hearing, I was like, "Yep, you got to let him freelance because this is. He's he's got what it takes." Were you afraid he was going to say you can't handle the truth? <laughs> <laughs> we were very close to doing some bits. There, yeah, yeah, there were. He he was restraining himself had, from doing bits. Yeah, I mean, and you can if and it is to be said. The one, you know, the one thing about Dan's face is that. He always appears to be having a slight smirk. He does this, you know? And so it was just a question of if that was going to be like off putting, but he, I mean, you just did great. I like I, there, <laughs> it. was so easy. Certainly off putting to my mom growing up. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Wipe that, that look off. Slap that <laughs> grin off your face. But yeah, that's what, when I walked back in there after the bathroom and I just saw him up there <laughs> looking like I've seen him in every meeting we've had with our boss, <laughs> where he's clearly. <laughs> Clearly not going to listen to anything we're being told. <laughs> it had to help what... I was like, damn, okay. I'm back in the game now. It had to help that I went last, too, because I was unimpressed with their yeah, side. How, how the worst of Their side's be. testimony. I saw how it happened, you know, how they tried to hammer Jake or whatever, and I don't know. I just... It felt... <laughs> well, we tried to tell you all... It felt like at that point, it was like, now I get to experience that. I'm now... This is a rare occasion that I should try to, you know, while while being wary of what do they got? Sure, they got to have something. But like, uh, you treated it like a theme park. Like, no, I want to. I want to now, you know, know what this is like, and and you know, it's it was it was very interesting. Like that was, it, that I was, was involved clear. in an interesting experiment. That was very clear. You know, we tried to tell y'all from the very beginning of this case that this is not the kind of case from cumulus aside where you can hold stuff back and surprise people with it later is you just can't do it you know when you get the complaint that's everything they could find and we were holding things back that we could have done true or used although uh frank just pulled out the big gun on jake so, <laughs> let's just ruin this guy for the next three weeks uh did either of you have a favorite answer that you gave 
vanilla ice. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Again, I, I couldn't really tell how down for bits <laughs> the the judge was going to be, but it is true that my former manager, or excuse me, uh, agent, agent that we referenced before was the manager and agent for Vanilla Ice. So when they asked me about... What like, was the context? Yeah. Uh, they asked me who negotiated my last contract. And they were like, did you have an agent work on that? And they were like, what is his name? And I gave the name and was like... Uh, they were like, oh, he's worked in the entertainment industry for some time, correct? And I said, yes, I believe he actually used to be the agent and manager of Vanilla Ice. Okay, so they, okay. Which they does you indicate that. that that was a long time ago. I don't think they were. No, but they, it wasn't, <laughs> they set it up for you. Yeah, I didn't you just. You didn't even know they were going to. No, I didn't just throw it out there. Yeah. I think they probably thought I was going to say he's been in the industry for a long time. Yeah. But for me to illustrate that. Right, that time stamps it. Vanilla exactly, Ice right? Was not we not big don't... like last year. No, no. And then for Dan, I mean. Come on. It's on the pillow. Yeah. yeah. What, what the you... geofencing part? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really... Seriously, I got to go back. I I say I'm an over-prepper, and I didn't go back and look at the transcript this morning or anything, uh, but well, it was, I don't remember what... The... To me, what was awesome about it was... Um, and I, we don't have to like use their names or anything, but the attorney that was talking to you, I believe, actually said, like, can we strike some of this... like? He got so flustered by whatever it is that you are <laughs> that he was like, I don't even want that out there. Well, he did tell me – I asked the questions here. I know, but he also, like, at that point was like, ah. Because I'm also a person that interviews people, and I like to I, – I know. Yeah, the the question you asked him, y'all were going through the geofencing stuff, and you, you just refused to believe that that existed. Um, and and you said I don't think that's possible on podcast. Have you ever seen a podcast do it? <laughs> to the, right. You, well, I, I was <laughs> as we were going through the discussion because I had never heard of it before. Yeah. I was thinking in my head, had I been him, what I would have done if I could find another person that has done this, I could then say to us, yes, well, this is done. Speaking of what your mom wants to slap you for, exactly how it went, if I recall correctly, was he said. Have you heard of another podcast doing that before? And then you said, have you ever heard of a podcast doing that before? Would you just rephrase or not oh, rephrase, but just say the exact same thing that your mom said back to you, yeah. but put a little bit different em- emphasis on a different word. That's when they really are like, I'm going to smack you. Yeah, that's not <laughs> a good idea sometimes. And I feel like in that moment he wanted to. The one thing I do remember going back and forth on was... Um, have you ever heard? He thought I would nod along and agree with him on certain things. And if you guys remember the term goodwill. Yes. yes. Oh. Philip Philip trained you very well on you listen to the question before you answer. But logically I don't know what goodwill is. No one does. I am a I am not someone who really believes in mystical things and uh somehow I do kind of feel like karma's I don't know. I try to spread a little. We'll give an extra dollar tip here or there. And then you think hopefully that comes back to you somehow. I don't know. That's called buying off guilt. It's okay. Is that what? Is that yeah. all that is? <laughs> That's all that is. Trust okay. me. <laughs> um, but like as far as like goodwill, um, did the – I can't remember how the phrasing was, but it, it had something to do with all the goodwill that the ticket gave you. Mm-hmm. I mean, by us working at the ticket, certainly it's a big-time radio station and stuff, but – that just if you just start working there, all of a sudden now you have all this goodwill because the ticket in general has goodwill, and now you have taken away that goodwill, um, and we're using that to attack the ticket. And he's like, well, you would agree that uh, you know you've gotten a lot of goodwill from the ticket. I think that was kind of how it was phrased. And I was like, no, I do not think I would agree with that, and that's threw him off. Like, whoa, whoa! I thought that was just going to be a. Of course, we could all agree with that. I mean, it's the ticket. And uh, I just kept going back and forth like, well, no, I mean, define. If he was know. actually surprised by that, Dan, then that was his first employment law case. I'm not sure, though. I, I, I can't remember if I asked him this or was just thinking this in my head. Like, did we ever get a goodwill bonus? <laughs> it's like Dan and I always talk about. <laughs> Let's go down and cash our goodwill check. Right. The goodwill bank and pay our goodwill mortgage with our goodwill dollars. Yeah. Just our, <laughs> our you know, you got a lot of good feedback on Twitter today. On oh, the show. fantastic. Okay, well, let's go to my the good engagement feed- check. Good, good, good feedback uh, mailbox. And, yeah. and, and 
and see if I could pay a bill with that. So I don't remember if I asked him. Uh, no, you did not, because if you did, I would have fallen out. Remembered that one? <laughs> yeah, I would have. I would have fainted. I would have been laughing so hard. But I might have said we didn't. We got bonuses based on ratings. Yeah, you, know, you brought I, up like I mean, we got Stern. I can't yeah, re- yeah. Oh, yeah. Stern. I thought uh, that was Howard a great Stern. Point. If, if you know, a lot of, a lot of hate people, or a lot of people hate Stern, or whatever. You know, so you just saying that he just has goodwill, right? Because he has great ratings. Yeah. No, I mean, like great ratings don't public mean enemy good number will. one. Yeah, yeah. So where did the pillow quote come from? Was it the goodwill or the geofencing? Geofencing. geofencing. Okay. Yeah. What does the pillow say? You want to read it, Frank? Where is it? Because I think you were asked, have you ever? Uh, did you Maybe look not. into geofencing before you started podcasting? Frank brought us, bought us a pillar. <laughs> and this is the quote, Blake. So, yeah, I guess you were just going on about geofencing, and uh, you told the lawyer, I had not, did not look into something I had never heard of. Right, it was after I said <laughs> I had never heard of it. Then he said, did oh, you so look you into it? Did you look you ever, into it? Have you looked into it? Yeah, yeah well, that's exactly what I he did. I literally had never heard of it before no. he mentioned it that day. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and he, he, he thought it was going to be a good punctuation of his line of questioning after asking you all these questions about geofencing he thought it was a good punctuator to say so you never look even looked into it and your answer was yeah i didn't look into something i didn't know existed <laughs> <laughs> hey mccole who's been a he's a uh, a big listener and um certainly a consultant on this whole thing uh did you, you certainly read the whole transcript? Uh, do you want to give uh, any thoughts on just the the hearing oh, in general? Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I, I didn't have uh, the uh, wherewithal to go through the whole thing, but uh, you know, I just I think it's just really great when you're able to um, answer the questions, but sort of. Um, I, I don't know. You were. You were. I think I'm not were saying my to, part in general. It just anything. No, no, I know, but but. I mean, the part that does stand out is that, you know, this thing is as serious as a heart attack and you're able to sort of um, be like totally accurate and kind of irreverent at the same time, which uh, I mean, I think is really effective. Right. I mean, because I mean, you especially Dan, have a very effective way of like kind of making fun of the person who's asking stupid questions. And uh, I think that goes a long way in sort of um, undermining the credibility of their case. So at the end of the case, are we at the end? He only asked that so that he'd get another compliment. Well, I, yeah. <laughs> and Jake, you're, uh, but I, okay, <laughs> what for it. Yeah, Stop it. No. Me, no, 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 but I, I really do have to, I mean, you know, we see business disputes a lot in, in these cases. And I feel like the only time I see people kind of tearing up on the stand is in, if it's in like family court, right? And if it's like a divorce and I feel like, especially your separation from, the company, um, you know, I mean, like, I know people love to say, oh, well, it's just business or it's not show friends, it's show business. But like, I mean, I am, you know, it's compelling that you would have like an emotional attachment to the people that you worked with for 15 years. Like, I think that humanizes your, your side of it. And, and frankly, I think it's kind of crazy when people don't feel that kind of emotional attachment. Kind of was like a divorce case for you guys. It yeah, was. absolutely. And yeah. People call these, and to the listeners, people call these cases business divorces sometimes for exactly this reason. And this is a highly unique situation, you know? Highly unique. Yeah. Any other radio station in town or probably or many across the nation. construction company or something. But, right. yeah, but, I mean, but yeah, even this radio station among radio stations sure. is, is very unique. Um so at the end, I'm just looking for my notes. The judge, you know, did come out and say, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, I deny the temporary injunction. Okay, which I guess was they wanted to stop us from doing our podcast until the trial. So there's still a trial. But this is the, all this was was just the temporary injunction. This isn't like a, we now don't have to go to trial. No, this, there's still a trial on the books. Uh, but will give particular li- particularized <laughs> finding in the next two weeks. This is what she says. Um, at this point, I wrote this note. I want to stand up and applaud her. Uh, like I just felt like I didn't know. I don't know what she would say, and you know, and but it felt like a weight lifted. I don't know what you felt like at that point. Oh, 100 um, percent. And it's kind of like a thing where you feel really, really happy. 
Like, let's say you're with your mom and you and your brother are getting in trouble, but she just starts like, I know it's your fault, and it's a bit, but if you start celebrating too much, oh, yeah. <laughs> then, you know, you might catch some of it too. So we all are just like solemn. We're just like sitting there straight face like that. We, I wanted to hug you all, uh, and I don't hug. Uh, but I was, I, I was, do think we prepped you for this. Uh, but I was very, very excited. Yeah, like, did you? Do not change your face. Yeah. Did you? Mm-hmm. I kind of, I'm, I'm all, I always do. Did. No, you probably did. If that's something you generally <laughs> say. Uh, but I don't think you needed to, to stop us from, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yes, uh, then she did kind of say some things like, uh, uh, you know, um, that we could approach, you know, Maybe lawyers should step out of this, and maybe you guys should uh, talk behind their lawyers' backs. I think there's a settlement to be, to be had here. She kind of intimated that she doesn't think this should go to trial, uh, that that I, I think you guys should somehow approach, uh, you know, the, the behind the scenes. Let's get, get rid of the lawyers here. Let's get rid of the suits. Um, and... Yes, she said she would, if we wanted her to, get involved in settlement talks. And I wrote in parentheses, what does that mean? I did not know what that meant, her getting involved. But I liked it because it did seem that she was um, pro Dan and Jake, uh, or at least pro our you know, defense of what they were bringing. I don't know that she liked us in particular, but she, I, it did seem like she, she liked our case mm-hmm. uh, from the beginning and I thought okay that's good she should get involved because she'll really push them to not take this to trial she liked your legal case that's what she, I mean yeah. she, she's pro Adam Romo yes Boy. <laughs> I feel like she by the end of it I don't know I kind of felt like Dan and I were almost like the Blues Brothers like we, what are we doing here like how do we how do we end up in this place like just standing up looking like two morons I feel like, but by the end of it, I feel like she was like, "All right, at least these guys aren't like BSing." We've run through so much time today. I think we should do a separate thing with Adam Roma at some point in the future sure. to uh, <laughs> honor him because I'd like to bring him in. But yeah, it's it's we've been sitting around a long time today. It's, it's been a very long time. And if you're listening to this, maybe you already know this is day four of mm. or day three or whatever of. Uh, however oh, we we this should up. say this. Uh, how many people are going to unsubscribe during a week of yeah. spring break? <laughs> ah, I mean, <laughs> you should just put up a disclaimer at the beginning of like it's not getting better for the rest of the week. Just uh, wait until next week if you don't like this first episode. Well, compare it to us just doing nothing, right? Like compare it to a week off. I know, but it's it's better than nothing. It's not as much y'all talking as <laughs> annoying. I think people, people find it interesting. Not- um, I can't remember if it was me or if it was you, but at the end, the end, end. Didn't I ask her if she'd take a picture with you? Did. <laughs> I, forget. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm never. She's like, s- not now, Mr. Kemp. I'm never going to see this person ever again. Right. They no. obviously had like a top ten most impactful decision in my life. We're dressed up. Yeah. We're like already, if there's ever a time, put my makeup on. This was the last day of the settlement. Yes. yes. Yeah. Did she take a picture with you? No. She was like uh, in another setting. <laughs> no. She was. She was at first. I thought she was going to do it. I know. And then she said. Well, it was kind of like Ralph Northam almost hitting the uh, what is it? The moonwalk. <laughs> the moonwalk. Whenever he got accused of doing blackface, yeah, he's like, "Oh, wait a minute, no." So she said she's going to give a detailed description. So now, I think that was. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm going to give my opinion because I give my opinion on everything. That that she was saying to them, "Do you want all this? My real thoughts public." Or do you all want to come to a settlement? That is what yes, she was saying. Because here's a, here's a couple of guys <laughs> who have said, been wanting a settlement. Two the, weeks. Here are a couple of guys who've been wanting a settlement the whole time. The fact that we don't have a settlement, she's only surmising this not, must not be because of these two guys. So you know they didn't want to force this hearing. The hearing what took place, it did go as poorly for, for you as I thought they thought it would. So now I can put all my thoughts in writing or. You guys can come to a settlement, and none of these thoughts will ever get out. And there will be no official winner or loser because it was a settlement. And everybody can come to their own conclusion on who won or who lost. But all I know is we were doing something. We got sued for doing it, told to stop. And then we had a settlement that concluded we could do that exact same thing. 
So that's just my view of the whole thing. And sure. nobody won and nobody lost. What did Dan and Jake earn in the settlement? <clears throat> well, we find out in the next episode, as well as answer a question or two from our listeners, as well as update you on where the case is now. Yes, it's not 100% over, as there still is a case in front of the National Labor and Relations Board that still has a chance to make history. Plenty more to get to as we wrap up Kemp et al. versus Susquehanna. Again, the next episode is not free and will not be available wherever you get your podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash the dumb zone and sign up to receive full access to our Lawyers Roundtable miniseries. That concludes tomorrow. Adios, mofo.